Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a nationwide legal settlement, now law in California, what the new rules mean for homeowners. And Mexico's old ruling party, back in power. Voters return the pre to the presidency. Plus a look at the power of the Asian American vote in the upcoming U.S. presidential election. And join me at our roundtable to find out how the Affordable Care Act will affect your health insurance coverage and premiums. Plus, scientists explain how San Diego's predicted jump in wildfires is linked to climate change and how that can impact our ecosystem. And we've gotten very strong responses to our recent story about a program to let Muslim women go swimming with no men around. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. California is now the first state to take a national mortgage settlement and turn it into law. Today's vote by the legislature expands the rules of the settlement with the nation's top five mortgage lenders. The rules now apply to all lenders in California. The law increases penalties for robo-signing. That's where a foreclosure is approved without proper review. It also forbids a practice known as dual-track foreclosure, where lenders continue foreclosing on a home while working with the owner on a loan modification or short sale. Homeowners have to be given a single point of contact with their lender and can sue a lender if there's a significant violation of the law. The measure now goes to the governor for his signature. Voters in Mexico have elected a new president, Enrique Peña Nieto. The vote marks a return of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI. It was thrown out of power 12 years ago. For some background and analysis on the election, we go to Monica Ortiz Uribe of the Fronterista. She joins us via phone from El Paso. Monica, uh, Peña Nieto didn't get the expected mandate. He did win about 38 percent of the vote. What do you think that means for, the, uh, for Mexico in general? Well, certainly that is the million-dollar question on everybody's mind. Um, I can tell you for the last three months on places like Facebook, there's been this constant stream of graphics warning that the return of the PRI would be a return of a party that's notorious for corruption, for lavish spending, and for pacts with organized crime. Basically, a return of the dinosaurs, is, which is what the old guard uh, PRIistas are called. I mean, in fact, today I saw a, a pretty dramatic graphic of a T-Rex head in the center of the Mexican flag that had apparently just swallowed the eagle that's in the middle of that same flag. But now, Peña Nieto has said, he, he said in his speech last night, return to the past. And in fact, some analysts in Mexico say that Mexico is different now. There have been electoral reforms and transparency laws that will not allow the PRI to operate like a dictatorship anymore. And Peña Nieto is inheriting a country in crisis, and people are aching for reform from the violence and wanting to grow economically. So it's very likely that the Mexican public themselves will hold him and his party accountable, uh, just like they did the last administration. And interestingly enough, the majority of Mexican expatriates in the U.S. voted against Peña Nieto. Why do you think that is? So it's safe to say that the expats who actually vote um, outside of the country are from the middle to upper class, which tend to favor different political parties anyhow. Um, especially here where I live um, in, in El Paso, which is borders the northern part of Mexico, um, the PRI party of current president Felipe Calderón is very strong. And this is a party that is uh, often called conservative and Catholic, but certainly it's very pro-business. And a lot of the expats uh, that, that live in the United States have some sort of business ties to Mexico and to the industrial north. So it's more along the party lines that they lean in favor of a different party, that they are more likely to vote against uh, the, the PRI party. And as you mentioned in his victory speech, uh, Pino Nieto uh, said this is a new generation, not a return to the past. What do you think he can realistically do to move the country forward? So the top two issues across Mexico are security and economy. So the first item on his agenda is to address this terrible drug violence that has been plaguing the country for the past six years. And there 
50,000 people that have lost their lives. And most people that I've talked to, even in, in Juarez and in other parts of the country, they support confronting the drug cartels, but not necessarily the strategy that the current president has used. So Peña Nieto has talked about his strategy. It doesn't sound all that different. He talks about strengthening the police, uh, building a national police force that would combat organized crime. He wants to focus on cleaning up uh, the police and the judicial system, getting rid of crimes like kidnapping and extortion. Um, and in terms of the economy, one of the things he said he'll do is uh, to open up the uh, state-owned oil company, Bemex, to, uh, to private investment. Um, but again, economy and crime, that, those are going to be the top two priorities for, for the next president. From our fronteristess, Monica Ortiz Uribe. An international conference drew more than 150 demonstrators downtown today. They were protesting a proposed new trade agreement called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Nine countries, including the U.S., are meeting to discuss issues ranging from jobs to health care and energy. Pro-labor groups were joined by Congressman and San Diego mayoral candidate Bob Filner. He says the agreement won't improve the job market or make working conditions better. So how will the new health care law affect your insurance premiums and company options? Peggy Pico is talking about that with an insurance broker for San Diego companies over at the Roundtable. There's been a lot of talk about the impact of the new health care law on the uninsured, but more than half of all San Diegans have medical insurance, mainly through their employers. Joining me to talk about the effect of the law on the working insured is Mike Barone, president of Intercare Insurance Solutions, a brokerage firm that provides health insurance plans to employers. And Mike, let's roll up our sleeves and get right to the heart of the matter on this. Um, what everyone has been asking me is how will this new health care reform act, this law, impact you if you're working and insured? I think it depends on who you work for. If you work for a governmental agency, I don't think there will be any change at all. If you work for a private employer, I think it depends on the size of the employer. Under 50, I think there might, there might even be more options that you will see. Between 51 and 100, I don't think there will be a lot of changes. Over 100, I believe that you might even have more choices over time from a variety of different carriers. I think where you might be most affected in the private sector is if you work for an organization that has a high degree of part-time employees. Hotels, uh, retail, restaurants, things like that. And why is that? Because they don't qualify for the new, uh, they don't qualify for buying their own insurance? So the law states that if you're an employer with more than 51 employees and you have full-time employees, you have to provide them health insurance. So you've heard of this pay or play. Mm -hmm. What that means is if you do not offer insurance to your employees, you could pay a penalty. Some of those employers might actually want to pay a penalty versus to continue to offer health care. Because the penalty is really, what, $3,000? Uh, you know, it's, it's not that big. It could actually be $2,000 if you don't offer insurance at all. It's $3,000 if you offer an insurance and people take a subsidy and purchase care through an exchange. Okay, so that's the employers. Let's get back to the actual employees. Will premiums go up because of this? And that's what everybody's been asking. It's a good question. I think it depends on the sector. So if you're an individual, I think you could actually see a decrease in premiums. If you are a medium-sized employer, to be determined. I think large employers are going to see an increase in health care costs due to cost shifting. Okay, and we're speaking of costs, let's take a look at this because your company does a yearly survey on the cost of providing medical insurance to uh, their employer uh, to their employees. And so let's look at the numbers. Local companies spend close to five thousand dollars per employee, and if it's an employee and family, your company found close to fifteen thousand dollars. Will that change? Will companies save money? Will they pass things along to their employees? So those are the amounts that the employer is billed by the insurance company. The employer, in turn, then asks for a contribution to be paid by the employee. What we've seen are continual increases in the amount that the employer asks the employee to pay. So overall, I do believe that there will be an increase in the cost of health care, not due directly to health care reform, but medical trend in general.
Okay, will our state insurance commissioner, who would be the people or person who can fight those insurance uh, premium raises? Really, what, what's driving health care costs is not the insurance industry. It's really the health of the American population. 130 million people have chronic illness. 75% of the cost of health care is to provide care for those with chronic illness. 96% of Medicare patients, it's all about uh, treating chronic illness. We have to improve health and wellness and prevention. That is the way in which we're going to control long-term health care costs, not the insurance commissioner, who, by the way, to answer your question, will be very aggressive in holding insurance companies' feet to the fire to reduce premiums and keep, or at least keep them constant. I was going to say, doesn't this open up a world of uh, better competition? And in, in the past, in other arenas, we see that that actually drops prices. It's true, but I think health care is a little bit unique in this regard. What drives health care costs, 85 percent of every premium dollar is to be spent on health care costs, the actual cost of health care, which is increasing at over 10 percent a year. We have to, as a country, as a state, and as a city, improve prevention and health care. We have to prevent a, a person from having a large episode, which costs $50,000 in, in the hospital before it even happens. Okay, Mike Barone, thank you so much. If you want more information about this subject, there's another interview with Barone and a UCLA health policy expert. Just go to our website, kpbs.org. This July 4th will be extra special for 35 military members. They are now U.S. citizens. The all-military naturalization ceremony took place this morning aboard the USS Midway Museum. The new citizens came from 18 countries, including China, Cuba, Belize, the Philippines, and Mexico. Given this new opportunity to become an American, I'm also going to remember my traits, uh, my people, and all my traditions as well, continue to celebrate where I come from, and continue to enjoy who I'm now becoming as an American. They have been a difficult decision. Most of, the service, most of the service members are looking forward to voting in November as American citizens. President Obama's recent directive to stop deporting young illegal immigrants has been criticized by opponents as an attempt to win the Hispanic vote. But a new report says Hispanics are no longer the fastest growing racial group in the country. We have a look at what it means for the 2012 campaign. Here's Belva Davis from our media partner, KQED. Have you heard about the new top two primary law? With the November election fast approaching, voter outreach efforts are in full swing. The prime target at this Santa Clara County phone bank, a voting bloc whose political potential is on the rise. In the city of San Jose, one out of every 10 people who go to the polls will be Vietnamese. And what that tells you is the Asian influence is, is significant. But if the feedback these volunteers are getting is any indication, both political parties could do more to reach one of the most diverse electorates in the U.S. We have been able to talk to a lot of people in their language, and uh, they say, you know, nobody's ever called me before. Nobody's ever talked to me about voting before. Um, some of them have just become citizens, uh, and they say this is their first time voting, and they didn't know anything about the process, so they're very grateful that somebody's called them. According to the 2010 census, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are now the fastest growing racial group in America. While California has the largest population in the continental U.S., the ranks of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have also swelled in potential battleground states, a factor which could have major significance in the upcoming election. For Asian Americans, you know, the, the percentage of the population is, is slowly changing, too in these key battleground states. And I think both parties, if they're going to play geopolitics, have to understand that Asian Americans are going to be a potential swing vote. A May poll of Asian Americans revealed 59% favor Barack Obama, over 13% for Mitt Romney. But 27% remain undecided in the presidential race. The chance for swing vote potential hasn't gone unnoticed by Democrats, who recently launched 
a national get-out-the-vote effort led by party vice chair, Congressman Mike Honda. Historically, people looked at Asian Americans as a marginalized population because it's too small. But we turned that into a margin of victory, say that 1%, 3% margin of, of, our, of, our, your, of your votes can make a difference whether you win or lose. How you guys doing? Since 2001, Honda has represented the 15th district in the heart of Silicon Valley. This year, he's running in the newly drawn 17th district, the first outside Hawaii to have a majority Asian population. We caught up with him in San Francisco's Japantown. It's clear his influence in the community stretches far beyond his home turf. Mike Honda. Yeah, good man. Good man. Congressman Honda has been a tireless worker for his entire constituency. But for Asian Americans, he, he gives us a face as arguably the most famous uh, legislative leader for Asian Americans. Honda was influential in bringing President Obama to speak at a major Asian American gala in May. If somebody is suffering through injustice or inequality, we take up their cause as if it was our own. That's the story of America. And that's certainly the story of this community. To have the President of the United States come to an Asian American Pacific Islander uh, gala was a, was a first. And he went through a litany of information about Asian American and our issues and what we care about. And was probably the most precise speech I ever heard anybody give. Mahalo. Mahalo. Well, these Hawaiians here, yeah? What's up with that? Yeah, these are Asian Americans. We're supposed to be quiet. Yeah, we were rambunctious and happy, and you know, it was historic. The number of Asian Americans holding political office is also on the rise. This year, a record number are running for Congress, including 25 year old Lodi native Ricky Gill. I'm Ricky Gill. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm candidate for the United States Congress in California's 9th District. Gill has been designated a young gun by the Republican Party and has raised $1.3 million in a tight race against Democratic incumbent Jerry McNerney. He's been endorsed by leading Republicans like the national chair of the party and majority whip Kevin McCarthy. Gill says it's time for Asian Americans to take the spotlight. You know, in the first generation, I know that was the concern that my family had, which was bread and butter. You know, what are you going to do to put food on the table? Those are real God-honest concerns that immigrant families have. My family certainly had it. Um, and now in the next generation, after that provision of opportunity has happened for your, for your children, there's an expectation of bigger and broader involvement. And I think that's happening now. As farmers, you only get paid once a year, so the harvest in September is the most important time. Mm. And, uh, Gil, the son of doctors who immigrated from India to the San Joaquin Valley, grew up working in the family's vineyard. They own over a thousand acres. If you're uh, a South Korean business owner or an Indian American physician or a, um, a Hispanic small business owner, you want fewer regulations and red tape stifling you from really engaging the free enterprise system. If the Republican Party becomes the party of balancing the budget, of educational choice, of skilled immigration reform, I would subscribe to that as being fair. Hi, how are you? I want to introduce myself. My name is Ricky Gill. My name is Ricky Gill. I'm running for Congress here. Gill is hoping his farming roots will play well with other key constituents in this agricultural district. On the day we visited, he was working the crowd at the Lodi Zen Fest. I would really like for you to check into the water system. Okay. Water around here is very important. This community is really beginning just to tap, I think, their political potential where Asian Americans are also really not just voting, but also running for political office. To me, that's a higher level of political participation. And I think we're finally seeing that happen, not just Asian Americans getting elected, but sustaining it over time. So to me, that's exciting. That was Belva Davis reporting for our media partner, KQED's This Week in Northern California. If you lived through the San Diego's devastating wildfires of 2003 and 2007, you've probably noticed the imprint they've had on our ecosystem. The impact is likely to grow as researchers predict the number of wildfires in the county will rise because of climate change. 
Researcher Phil Unit, a curator with the Natural History Museum in Balboa Park, and Matt Ron, an environmental scientist at SDSU, joins me today to explain the situation. And Phil, I'm going to start with you. Tell us right now what the effects so far have been of those two massive wildfires we had in California. The uh, coniferous forest on the Cuyamaca Mountains has been pretty much replaced by a chaparral made of Ceanothus palmeri. Uh, vast areas of uh, chaparral have uh, recovered, but then many of those were burned again in, in 2007. Uh, I've worked on studies of the effects of the fires on birds, and uh, we've seen many profound changes with uh, certain species decreasing, and, but others increasing, taking advantage of those burned areas. So there was certainly a huge environmental impact. What does the climate change, other than it gets hotter, uh, have to do with uh, increasing the prediction of wildfires like we saw in 2003 and 7 here in San Diego? Well, certainly as the uh, climate gets warmer, then that's uh, better for fires, uh, bad for those of us who don't want the fires. Uh, so uh, the frequency of fires is expected to increase as well as their intensity. Absolutely. There's been a, quite a bit of research on this. Numerous studies have uh, been going on on this. And I want to ask you, Matt, it sounds a little doomsday, like, oh, we're going to have more fires and they're going to be hotter. Do you agree with those predictions? And, and if you do, why? Well, yeah, I do agree with the predictions. One of the things that we've noticed is in the last 10 years, uh, half of the uh, the largest 20 wildfires in California's history have happened in the last decade. That is an alarming statistic, really. And so it helps us understand that into the future, if temperatures increase and precipitation patterns change, uh, we're likely to expect uh, uh, more frequent and more intense fires. When you say more intense, uh, fire's hot, it burns. What, what could be more intense? Well, it, it, a lot of it has to do with the type of vegetation. So uh, like Phil had mentioned, a uh, change in the vegetation type really can alter the, uh, the intensity of the fires. Um, but also the fuel moisture, the, the amount of moisture that a plant is able to hold um, will, will change over time as precipitation patterns change. And so that does alter the intensity of the fires and makes them a lot hotter. You have more dry trees, more dry bush, I'm assuming that's uh, so it burns yeah. a little hotter and faster. Now you researched a phenomenon called a positive feedback loop. Can you explain that to us? Well, it's pretty well documented that as the uh, frequency and intensity of fires increases, uh, what you have is a change in your ecosystem and uh, this sort of climate feedback loop. So as the uh, climate becomes hotter and drier, you have a more frequent fire, which leads to an increase in carbon dioxide emissions, of course, which are related to climate change itself. Uh, that leads to this sort of nice circular positive feedback loop that a lot of scientists are concerned about. This is exacerbated quite a bit by a change in the vegetation type and especially the uh, change that we're witnessing in Southern California of uh, invasive species and grasses. Right, and in my understanding, Phil, you'd mentioned that the, the forest, especially in the Cuyamaca, is being re replaced with more chaparral types of things. How is the recovery going uh, otherwise? Are we seeing species come back? Are we seeing um, new flora grow? How, how's it been going since 2007? The, one of the interesting things that come, came out of our studies was that almost every uh, type of response you could imagine uh, is exemplified by some species or another. So there are certain species that I'll refer to birds since they're my expertise. Uh, forest birds like the mountain chickadee and pygmy nuthatch that were really decimated, and some chaparral and oak woodland birds like uh, the California thrasher and Hutton's vireo that were decimated and their recovery has been uh, very slow. And then there's other species uh, like the lazuli bunting and black chin sparrow that take advantage of those, uh, those shrubs, the chaparral that's replaced the forest in the Cuyamaca Mountains and become far more abundant than they were previously. Okay, and one last quick question, just a word or two from each of you. I'm gonna start with you, Matt. What's one thing that we can do? Is there anything we can do to protect ourselves from future wildfires? Absolutely. Um, there are four main factors associated with wildfires. Uh, it's the environment, um, the management practices on the landscape, 
the resources used to fight the fire and the staffing used to fight the fires as well. Um, obviously, we're not going to uh, alter the environment and temperature. Uh, uh, you know, we have no real control over that. Uh, managing, you know, 31 acres of the state responsibility area is an incredible challenge, um, but it's the uh, opportunity to put more firefighters and more resources to help fight fires. That's going to be important. Okay. On that note, we have to end. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight in the public square, I want to share a few of the nearly 200 comments we received about a story we aired on the Copley YMCA offering women's only swim hours for Muslim women. Most comments were not in favor of it. On Journey wrote, this is horrific and sad. It is rude and pompous and flies in the face of years and years of women's suffrage in our country. They are free to walk the streets to participate in our culture and they choose not to. There is no need to accommodate this perpetuation of demeaning women, not here, not now. Outside Two View said, many women, regardless of religion, may prefer a female only time slot to swim or use the facility. It would be unfair if the rule was exclusively for Muslim women. Other women who choose to swim in bikinis or whatever their culture allows must also be admitted at the same time. Then I think it would be a fair rule. California Defender focused on the money, saying separate but equal. I'm perfectly fine with this, with the exception that the YMCA is partially funded with public money. Removing that, any commercial or nonprofit organization should be allowed to set rules to attract the customers they want and prohibit the customers they don't. You can weigh in on this story and others by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or email us at kpbs.org. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great night.